are great, yes you are. You are great, yes you are. Holy one, holy one. You walked upon the sea. You walked upon the sea. Dr. Fourline um, is not a stranger to us, but he has not been to Lagos. Abuja, he has been, he's been to, we've been together on a, a couple of mission fronts. The eastern part of Nigeria, we were together early part of this year. Of course, I went to visit with him in Nashville this year in the U.S. And Pastor Sarah, you missed that particular session, you know, and... Um, is a person that has come to become like family for me. It amazes me. After mo more than, I think he was talking about almost 40 years in ministry. All these years he has put, he's still traveling down to Africa, going north. He knows our neighborhood and our neighboring countries, especially North African nations, more than those of us who live in Africa. So when he told me he was coming this period, I knew that this would be a great opportunity for us to be able to, especially us who are women, to be able to hook into this major movement, what God is doing right now on the earth, discipleship making movement. Please join me, all of you together, as we welcome Dr. James Fallen. Give him a big God bless you as he comes. You are blessed among women. <laughs> God bless you, sir. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Ah, thank you so much, Pastor Sarah and Pastor David, for the opportunity. Oh my goodness, um, to be able to share with you. Um, before I do that, before I share about disciple-making movements and some essentials about that, I think when I have this many women gathered, I want to give acknowledgement to some women who have made an indelible impact upon my life. I don't know if you've ever seen the poster, but there's a poster and it has, there's a post, and then on that post is a turtle sitting on the post and the caption underneath it says if you see a turtle on a post you know it did not get there by itself somebody had to place that turtle on the post because it can't get there by itself throughout the journey i've had almost 40 years in ministry i would not be doing any of it had it not been for some very special women who have been speaking into my life. It did start with my mother, very godly woman, um, who from the very earliest ages taught me to love God and introduced me to missionaries. She had them in our home. She welcomed them and had hospitality with missionaries in our home. Um, my wife, Anita, we've been married uh, this year 39 years in December. Um, during the years of ministry, I figured up all of the nights that I spent away from home. I spent away from home during these nights. If you put them all together, there's been about seven years that I've not been at home. And the truth is, my wife has carried a very significant heavy load all of those years. To Pastor Sarah, I honor you because I know that you carry a similar load because of your husband and the travels that he does. I would not be where I am if it not been for my wife, Anita. Um, and um, 
the truth is, when our children were small, our children are all grown. We have five grandchildren, um, and um, we have, all three of our kids love God. They serve God. They're very committed. They're all involved in some kind of ministry. And uh, that would not have happened if it had not been for my wife. When I was not there a lot, she was keeping the fire burning. She was keeping it. She was making sure that our children understood to love God and to keep His commandments. So I honor them. But I want to tell you one story before I get into this because there's another woman that had a very significant impact on my life when I was 10 years old. I was just a boy. And... Um, my father was a professor. He was a, a theological professor uh, at a, a Bible college. And in the summertime, when I was not in school, sometimes I would be on campus, but all of the students were gone, and so it was boring. There wasn't anything to do. So my mother was up there with my father, and they were cleaning out his office. And so there I was. My mom and dad are cleaning out the office, and I had nothing to do. And so I was pestering my mother. I'm bored. I don't have anything to do. I'm bored. I want something to do. So here's what she said. She said, James, go down to the end of this street. There is a house that is on the corner of the street. Walk inside the front door because it's some apartments, some flats are there. Walk inside the front door, walk up the stairs, and then the first door on the left, knock on the door. A woman will come to the door and ask her if she will tell you about India. So I did. I walked to the end of the street. I saw the house. I opened the door. I walked up the stairs. I saw the door on the left. I knocked on the door, and this woman with white hair opened the door. She was an older woman at that time. She was in her 70s. And I said, my mommy says you will tell me about India. And she smiled, and she said, come on in. I'm sure my mother had called her. This woman's name was Laura Bell Barnard. I'm sure my mother called her and said, my son is going to come down. He needs something to do. Will you please do something with him and tell him about India? So I went in and I sat down and Miss Laura Bell Barnard pulled out pictures of India. She was telling me stories about India. She was talking to me about millions of people, people groups in India where there were millions of people and had no opportunity to hear about Jesus at all. She made a statement. It actually was quoting someone else, uh, Oswald uh, Smith, but, but she was the first one I heard say it. She said, no one deserves to hear the gospel twice until everyone has heard the gospel once. I had been hearing the gospel ever since I was a boy, ever since I knew anything. I was at church every Sunday, and, and I knew I had heard the gospel thousands of times, and she was telling me about people groups in India who had millions of people in their people group, and no one was telling them the gospel. And as a 10-year-old boy, that bothered me. And it still bothers me today that there are people in people groups around the world who have no gospel witness. No one is sharing the gospel with them. So at 10 years old, there was a fire that started in me. And part of that was created by a woman. By the way, she was a single woman. She never married. The interesting thing about Laura Bell Barnard was she went to India in 1935. Now, in the history of our country in the United States, 1935 was in the middle of what we called the Great Depression. It was the worst economy in the history of our country. There were people literally starving to death. 
It was a very difficult time and there was almost no money. And in 1935, Laura Bell Barnard was 27 years old. She was from a town in the country of the state of Georgia, a very small farming community called Glenville, Georgia. The denomination of which we were a part had no missions agency at all. So here this 27-year-old single young woman feels the call of God to go to India. And not only does she feel the call of God, she starts acting on it in an economy where there was no money. She starts trying to find a way to get to India. She goes to the dock in New York City. She gets on a freighter, not a passenger ship. A freighter. She's the only woman on board and this is going to be about a five to six week journey, she gets on board by herself as a 27 year old with $85 in her pocket and a one way ticket to India. I'm telling you, through the history of missions, through the history of the development of the church, there has been an indispensable role of women. So when you sense the call of God upon your heart, when you sense clearly that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, don't let anyone tell you that you cannot. You follow the call of God upon your life and the power of the Holy Spirit will open doors and He will provide a way where there is no way. So before I shared this, I really wanted to share how important that many women have been in the development of me. So all of you, make sure that you are having equal development in the lives of people who are around you because you have no idea where your influence will spread. The presentation we're going to look at, and we'll try to do this as quickly as we can, is called Disciple Making Movements. When I was a senior in Bible college, I was in a philosophy class. There was an Italian who was teaching the class. His name was Dr. Robert Piccarelli. Philosophy, I don't know, some of you have probably in university taken a philosophy class. Oh my goodness, it's amazing how complicated that can be. So if you've taken philosophy class, you know what I'm talking about. It is so challenging to think about how people could come up with such strange ideas. So Dr. Piccarelli was talking about existentialism, I think. And he was describing to us the philosophy of some existential thinkers. And he looked out at us. And he saw that we were you know, like just blank stares in our faces. We were not understanding what he was saying. And Dr. Piccarelli asked this question. He said, are you all confused? And we just said, yes, we are. <laughs> we are confused. We have no idea what you're talking about. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, good. Confusion is the first step of learning. <laughs> Idiots are never confused. Ah, that made so much sense to me. When you're confused, that's not bad. That's the first step of learning. But I will say this also, when you're frustrated, when you are frustrated, sometimes that's not bad either because frustration is the first step toward change. The truth is, we will not change if we're not frustrated. If we're okay with everything that's happening in our life, the truth is, most of you who came to Jesus later in life, you weren't necessarily a little girl, you came to faith maybe as a young person or an adult, you were frustrated with your life, and that's how you were willing to change. That's why you were willing to follow Jesus. And so frustration for me and the willingness to change came when I realized 
that the model that we are using around the world to plant churches simply can't get the job done. It costs too much. It takes too long. It makes few, too few disciples. We've got to find a way to start expanding the cause of Jesus Christ around the world that is infinitely reproducible. And when I was in that frustrating part of my life thinking about that in the 90s, back in 1994, an older missionary who had worked among Muslim people groups in Cote d'Ivoire in Ivory Coast he handed me a little book. I actually have the book in my satchel over there. It was a little booklet, about 60 pages, and it was called Church Planting Movements. Now, in that, he was talking about people groups like the Bhushpuri people in India that in 1990, there were eight, think about this, in 1990, there were eight Bhushpuri churches. By 1994, there were 2,000 Bhushpuri churches. Today, by the year 2000, there were 20,000 Bhushpuri churches. Today, there are about 40,000 Bhushpuri churches and over 3 million Bhushpuri believers. And when I started thinking about movements and seeing movements and seeing how God was working around the world, I said to myself, it is possible with this to actually finish the task of world evangelism. We can see Matthew 24, 14 happen. You remember that. Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world to every nation, and then the end shall come. So if we want the end to come, if we want Jesus to come back, we need to make sure that the gospel gets to every ethnic group around the world. And I believe that can happen through disciple-making movements. Let me just share a few of these things. We're going to see if this will be strong enough to reach back there. If not, then Ubina will have to advance this for us. All right. The, oops, it is actually advancing. So, the first essential principle, if you're going to see disciple making movements happen, the first essential principle is this prayer and fasting. I'm thankful that I know that Pastor David, Pastor Sarah are very passionate about prayer and fasting. But I will tell you, that we will not see movements around the world. We simply will not see movements if it's not for prayer and fasting. This is God's work. What we're talking about and what we'll talk about for the next few minutes is God's work. It's His heart desire. God is working before we ever show up on the scene. This is so important. Please get this. I've always been passionate about evangelism and reaching lost people. But here's what I used to think. I used to think that when I was going to go and reach someone who was lost, that when I started talking with them, that's when God started working. You know, when I started talking with them, God was starting to work through my words. But honestly, in my mind, I'm thinking God's really not working until I show up on the scene and start talking. Let me clearly say this. God is working right now all across Lagos, all across the neighborhoods, in every street, in every home, all across the Holy Spirit of God is alive and passionately working long before you ever show up. The reason that we pray and the reason that we fast is so that we can find out where God is working and join Him there. Our job is to do that. And we will not find persons of peace without prayer and fasting. We will not see miraculous interventions without prayer and fasting. Now, essential principle number two. Once we've prayed and we've fasted, Here's what I believe. 
when you pray and fast and you're asking God to use you in your area where God has placed you to see a movement of God in your area, when you pray and fast, God is going to lay on your heart individuals, neighborhoods, different peoples. He's going to lay that on your heart. Now once you do, once He does do that, then you need to find some access ministry which is going to allow you to reach into that neighborhood. Think about a neighborhood right now that's around where you live and you realize there's not many people who are following Jesus there. Maybe there's a neighborhood on the other side of Lagos and you realize it's a very deprived neighborhood. It's a very deprived area of the city of Lagos. And in your mind as you're thinking about that, God will lay on your heart to be His instrument to see a movement of God in that area. When that happens, you're going to have to find some reason, some access ministry to get you there. Now you see in this picture here, there's a picture of a uh, girl getting water from a well that's there. There also is uh, some boys playing football. There is uh, some medical work that's happening in an inoculation with a baby. And then there's also someone who's using their career. Maybe in this particular instance, oil and gas. And so they're going to use that as an access ministry. Well, the important thing for us to remember or to think about when we're talking about access ministries, we have to have a reason to be in the community or among the people group that's not our own. So we have to have a reason to be there. Find a human need and meet it. There's a friend of mine, he's Ethiopian. His name is Aichi or Aichilam. And he puts it this way. An access ministry is us as God's people answering the prayer of the lost. Now let me ask you, do lost people pray Did you pray before you came to know Jesus? The truth is, most everyone prays even if they don't know who they're praying to. When there's a real sickness in their home, or maybe there's been a death, or maybe there's not enough finances, or there's not enough food, people start crying out. They may not even know who they're crying out to. Maybe in their, in their village or in their area of the city, there's a lot of sickness because there's not even clean water. They're crying out. So an access ministry is actually answering the prayer of lost people. We as the people of God are bringing peace, as it says there. If there's a village and they don't have clean water, And in that village, there's a lot of sickness as a result of that. There is no peace in that village. If there's disease that's happening in a village or an area of the city, there is no peace that's there. The truth is, all around us in neighborhoods, there is no peace. There's a lot of houses, homes. There is no peace in that home because there's fighting and struggling. There's drug addiction. There's alcohol addiction. Whatever it is, there is no peace that is there. An access ministry is us coming along and being people who bring peace. That's what Jesus did, if you'll remember. Jesus did not just tell the truth. He helped people with compassion. He reached out to them. I'm afraid sometimes we have turned evangelism into just words. Somehow we're going to talk with them and try to have them to accept Jesus. We're going to give them the four spiritual laws or we're going to give them the Romans road to salvation or we're going to use evangelism explosion or we're going to use some words and somehow through those words we're going to try to get them to pray a prayer and accept Jesus. Honestly, we as God's people have got to do more than just use words. We need to do what Jesus did. Jesus was teaching and he was preaching, but he also was feeding those who need to be fed. He was also healing those who were sick. He was also reaching out to those that no one would reach out to. You remember? 
John chapter 4, there was a woman at the well. She came to the well in the hot of the day at noon. Most every other woman would come to the well in the morning time when it was cool. But she came at noon. Why? Because she would be by herself. Why did she want to be by herself? Well, because she had had five husbands and the man that she was now living with was not her husband. She was ostracized of women. But who reached out to her? Jesus did. In Luke chapter 7, you remember that story? Jesus goes to the home of a Pharisee, one of the religious rulers. He goes to the home to eat dinner. While they are reclining there, they don't eat like we do. They, they would kind of lie down and they would eat, you know, in a reclining position. While they were there, a woman came in. Now, it says in Luke chapter 7 that she was a sinner. Now, the truth is we're all sinners. But Bible scholars would say that she most likely was a prostitute. Some people believe it, it actually was Mary Magdalene. We're not sure of that. But this woman, whatever the situation, God had been dealing in her heart. And she had heard about Jesus. And she had heard who Jesus was and how he was a man of compassion. So this woman comes in. And as she's standing behind Jesus, the grief of her own heart starts pouring out of her eyes and she starts weeping and the tears fall off of her cheeks and down and it falls on Jesus' feet. And perhaps she was embarrassed because her tears were falling on His feet but she takes her hair and she wipes the tears off Jesus' feet. Do you remember what the Pharisee said? The Pharisee said this, this man could not be a prophet because if he were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is and he would not allow her to touch his feet. I've got good news for all of us. Jesus does know who we are and he will allow us to touch his feet. So we, as the ambassadors of Jesus Christ, as the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, we are persons who bring shalom, who bring peace. We bring peace into the situation. And we reach out to those that no one else would reach out to. We reach out and talk to those that no one else would talk to. And in that access ministry, we are bringing peace. So first of all, you're praying and fasting. Second of all, once God lays on your heart an area, you find some access ministry to reach into that area. Essential principle number three. And by the way, this will be new to some of you in thinking, but I think it's so critical. You are finding persons of peace. You see over there, the red is an apostolic church planter. And by the way, I think everyone, every Christian needs to be a church planter. It's not a matter of somehow that some people are now ordained and they've gone through a number of different steps and now they're qualified to be a church planter. The truth is, God wants all of us to be reaching out and all of us to be reaching people. So, this apostolic church planter can be a teenager. It can be any of you, it can be any of us, we're going into an area and we're looking for the one in yellow, the person of peace. Now this is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 10. Jesus sent out the 70 in Luke chapter 10 and he, he basically tells them, pack light, don't take a whole lot with you, don't take an extra thing of sandals. Don't take a purse with you. Don't take all of this stuff. Don't be greeting people along the way. Just go, go. And when you enter into a person's house, if your peace rests on you, stay there. Stay there. 
If the person of peace, the man of peace, or the woman of peace is there, then stay there. And if there is not a person of peace, or if your peace does not rest upon you, then you're supposed to leave and dust your shoes off and say it will be more tolerable in the judgment for Sodom than for you because the gospel came to you and you didn't listen. All right, here's the principle. Before you ever go to that area of the city, before you ever go to that village, before you ever work among that people group, God is going in advance. He's going in advance of you. He's working in the stillness of the night. Many times among Muslims, he's giving them dreams of Isa, al-Masih, Jesus the Messiah. I have talked with countless Muslim people and had them share their dreams with me. So pray and fast. Pray and fast. Find an access ministry. And as you're going, you're looking for persons of peace. People that God is dealing with before you get there. And they will be receptive. Now, this is different than the way that I used to do evangelism when I was younger. I've always been passionate about evangelism. But honestly... My idea of evangelism was I wanted to convert you to Christianity whether you wanted to or not. And the truth is, I would talk with you and try to persuade you to become a Christian no matter how long that took. I remember being in a man's house one time and I was talking with him. He was skeptical. He was asking so many questions. He didn't, you know, how do we know the Bible's true? Where did Cain get his wife? How do we know that people didn't just go into a cave and write the Bible? And so, I mean, I'm answering every question he's got because I've been, I have been studying on apologetics and I've got all the answers. So he asks a question and I'm giving him an answer. He asks another question, I'm giving him an answer. I'm talking with him about biblical archaeology. I mean, I'm, I'm telling him everything. For three hours... He is asking questions, being very skeptical, trying to trip me off or something along that line. And for three hours, I'm trying to get him to come to faith in Jesus. Now, eventually, eventually, he prays. Now, the truth is, I think he prayed so I would leave. I mean, I'm thinking, he's thinking to himself, okay, just tell me what I need to say so you will leave my house. Honestly, to me, that was evangelism. I, I mean, but I, I've come to realize that that really is not what God is interested in. He's already working before I get there. I, and if a person is resistant, if, they, if they're resistant, if they're not open, I don't need to try to convince them that's not my job. The job of the Holy Spirit is to convince them, not me. And if they're not open, I can just dust my shoes off and I can move on. Now, I'm not saying I will never come back. Maybe in a village, there's no one in the village who is open at all and they're all hostile and non-receptive. I may leave that village. I may go back to that village in six months after I've prayed and fasted and God leads me back to that village. I'm not saying you always walk away from them forever, but I am saying this. Work with people who are receptive. They are persons of peace. The desire is for the whole community, not just individuals. So we're looking for the persons of peace who can open up the whole community. Persons of peace are those who have been prepared by God ahead of time. They are receptive. Please, that's underlined. They are receptive. They have a spiritual desire and are longing for answers. These are people who are open. When you get there, they're willing to listen. They're willing to talk. They are people of influence many times who can open the family or the entire community. We were, do a tr we were doing a disciple-making movement training in Senegal among a denomination there. And um, after the training, they were praying and fasting and they were asking God to lay on their hearts areas where He was moving. 
And there was a guy named Jeremy, Senegalese guy named Jeremy. And he sensed as he was praying and fasting that God was calling him to go to an island off the coast of Senegal, which is 100% Muslim. So, in obedience, Jeremy gets in a boat and is headed to the island with a bunch of people. As they're traveling on this boat, someone on the boat realizes that Jeremy's not a local. And so they asked Jeremy, this, this man asked Jeremy, uh, have you got business on the island? And Jeremy says, yes, I do. And the man says, what kind of business? Jeremy says, I'm on a mission. The man says, what kind of mission? He said, a mission for Jesus. Now, I'm not suggesting that if you're going to go to a Muslim island that that's always the response you need to give. But Jeremy felt led of God and he was very open. I'm on a mission for Jesus. So the guy asks him, do you know about this Jesus? He said, yes, I do. He said, do you know much about him? He said, yeah, I think I do. So the man said, when we get there, could you come to my house? Could you meet with me and my family? Because we have heard about this Jesus, but we don't know much about him. Could you come and tell us? And he said, yes, I will. So he comes to this man's house, and he starts a discovery Bible study. We'll talk about that in just a second. He starts a discovery Bible study with this man, his family, and some of their friends. Another thing that we urge people to do is what Jesus said in Luke 10 when he sent out the 70. He said, pray and heal the sick. Honestly, the word of God needs to go forth not just with the words, but with power. There needs to be a manifestation of the power of an almighty God through the Spirit. And that's why Jesus said, heal the sick. Many times that's how Jesus confirms that he is God. Now, I work among Muslims almost exclusively. And let me tell you this about Muslims. Muslims, and some of you probably are those who've come out of Islam yourself, and you could testify to this. Muslims know that Muhammad was not a healer. Never in the Quran did Muhammad heal. But it also emphasizes that Jesus is a healer. Jesus is a miracle worker even in the Quran. That is why many times when Muslims are sick, they will actually look out for a Christian who will tell them something about Jesus because they know Jesus is a healer. Once again, do not try this if you've not prayed and fasted. Do not try this if you're not living in obedience to the written word of God and the revelation that he's given to you. But if you are living in obedience and you are following God with all of your heart and you've prayed and fasted and you've asked him and he's opened up your heart for a certain area and you go into that area and you find someone who is a person of peace and you find that there are sick people there, pray for them. In the strong and mighty name of Jesus, pray for them. You don't have to wait and call some pastor. The power of the Holy Spirit is just available to you as it is to Pastor David or Pastor Sarah. It's just available to you. And that's exactly what Jeremy did. He prayed for the, he said, are there people who are sick? And they brought a couple of women who were sick and he prayed for them. And God miraculously healed those women to confirm on that Muslim island that he is God. Now, what I have not told you yet is the man who invited him to his home was an imam. And so they started doing this discovery Bible study with an imam and his family. And after several of these studies, the imam said to Jeremy, he said, there are other imams on the island. I think that they would be interested in hearing about what you're saying. 
Would you be willing to do a Discovery Bible study with all of the imams on the island? I'm telling you, our Heavenly Father is working in advance of you. He is going in advance of you. He is working in every community. He is working in every neighborhood. He is working among all people. And as we pray and as we fast and then as God opens our heart for a certain area or a certain street or a certain neighborhood, then as you go and as you find that there are people who are open and they are persons of peace, then the Almighty God will show up. That's exactly what He wants to do. So as we think about persons of peace, how do you know a person is a person of peace? They might invite you to eat or even stay with them. They're open for a personal relationship with you. They will open the door to you voluntarily. You are not going to have to push this. They are willing to introduce you to others in their own family or their community. Brother David, I, I, I did not mention this in the last one, but I just feel led to tell this story. It's, by the way, it's not just in Africa that we hear these things happening. Let me tell you something that happened in the United States just a few months ago. We do not have many Muslims in the United States who are there permanently. We have uh, several hundred thousand who come to study, but we just don't have a whole lot of Muslims in the United States permanently. So most evangelical Christians have never met a Muslim. They've, <laughs> and I know that's hard to believe here in Nigeria, but they've never talked with a Muslim. There's a dear friend of mine, he's a pastor of a church. He's never met a Muslim. His name is Dave Dave's never met a Muslim. He's never talked with a Muslim. In fact, probably nobody in their church has ever talked with a Muslim or met one. But Dave loves me and invited me to come and share the ministry of reaching Muslims in Africa with their church. And so guess what? Their church started praying for Muslims. So a few months ago, I get a call. I'm traveling back from a speaking engagement on Sunday morning. And I get a call from Dave, and Dave says this. He said, James, <laughs> I've got to tell you what happened to church this morning. I said, well, what happened, David? He said, right at the end of our service, five minutes before we were about to leave, an older woman came in with a younger man about, looked like about her son, son's age. And they sat down at the back. And at the end of the service, they asked if they could see the pastor. So I went to talk with them. It was an Iraqi woman from Iraq. It wasn't a Kurdish woman. It was an Arab woman. She spoke Arabic. An Iraqi Arabic woman comes to his church. And the young man who is with, she only speaks Arabic. So the young man who is with her speaks English. He's a younger man and he, he speaks English, so he is going to be her interpreter. And he said that she told him through the interpreter that last night she had a dream. And in her dream, Isa al-Masi, Jesus, appeared to her in her dream. And he was holding a candle. And Jesus looked at her and said, Go and find someone who will tell you about the light. And she woke up. Muslim people all over the world honor Jesus. He is a prophet to them. And in their dreams, when Esau, when Jesus appears to them, it's a powerful thing. I myself have heard countless stories of dreams that Muslims have had. Countless stories myself as they have told me of dreams that they have received. I have never heard the same dream twice. 
It's always customized for that individual. So when she woke up, she asked her Iraqi friends, her Iraqi Muslim friends, she said, Jesus appeared to me in a dream. And he was holding a candle and he said, find someone to tell you about the light. And so they suggested you need to go to a Christian church because they can tell you about Jesus. So here she shows up in Dave's church. They've been praying for Muslim people, but they didn't know any. And God sends an Iraqi Muslim to them. Now Dave was saying, James, I hope I did the right thing. I said, David, please tell me you interpreted her dream. This is not hard. Jesus the Messiah, the light of the world, cared enough about you to come into your dream and to tell you to seek out for someone who would tell you who He really is. He's the Messiah. He's the light of the world. He is your Savior. Now let me tell you this. God's working before you ever get there. God's working even when you don't know it. God is working behind the scenes. He's working all over this city. He's working all over this country. He's working among the people you think are terrorists. God is working in ways that only He can work. And He will find a way where there is no way. So you need to make sure, find those people of peace when God lays someone on your heart. When He lays a neighborhood on your heart, go and find them. Now, not every person who welcomes you is a person of peace. For those of you who maybe have come out of Islam or you know a lot about Islam, the truth is Muslims are very welcoming as a general rule. I know right now there's a lot of tension, but generally Muhammad taught his followers to be welcoming and especially to welcome strangers. That is in their culture. So not everybody who welcomes you or even who invites you into their home is actually going to be a person of peace. At some point you will transition from a personal relationship to a spiritual conversation. Now if the person is a person of peace then they will continue with you and they will be receptive. So remember, we're looking for persons of peace. Now, that leads us to essential principle number four, a discovery Bible study. This, once again, is going to be transformational if you will let it. So if at this point you've been sleeping or you've been kind of drowsy or something, kind of shake yourself awake because this really could be helpful for you and it could transform you into a multiplier. It could transform you into a disciple maker. All right? Very quickly, go to the next slide, Ubina. Discipleship and church planting begin with the very first Discovery Bible study. Once you find a person of peace, let me urge you, do a Discovery Bible study with them, but not just with them. If you find a person of peace, ask them, do you know other people in your friends or your family who would be willing to do this Discovery study? So, it's not you that's going to teach them in this Bible study. It is the Holy Spirit of God that's going to teach them. We know in John chapter 6, and we all know this, you could probably, most all of you could quote this. It says, no man comes to the Father until what? The Holy Spirit draws them. No man comes to the Father until the Holy Spirit draws them in verse 45 of John 6, it says, And they shall be taught by God. Pastor David, Pastor Sarah, I really believe this is what has tripped up people. There's a whole lot of people that never will do a Bible study. They'll never start a Bible study. And the reason why, and a lot of these women who are sitting here right now, they've never done a Bible study, they've never led a Bible study, and the reason why is they don't think they know enough about the Bible. 
They're afraid that if somebody asks them a question, they're not a Bible expert. And somehow they think that if I'm going to do a Bible study, I'm somehow going to have to be some expert in the Bible. Let me tell you this. The Holy Spirit of God can use the Word of God and create the people of God. You can be a facilitator of finding that person of peace, getting a group together, and having a discovery Bible study where the teacher is the Holy Spirit and you are facilitating it. All right? The process is discovery. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. Everyone can lead a discovery study and therefore I become a church planter because the truth is when you take this into this neighborhood and then this group of people over a period of time the Holy Spirit deals with them and they all become followers of Jesus Christ, the truth is in fact you're starting to plant a church and everyone can do that. Experienced leaders, those within uh, the Dominion City movement who are experienced leaders, they can come alongside you and they can coach and they can facilitate you behind the scenes. You've got people that can help you. But the truth is all of you need to be released. We need to release all of you so that you can go across this city and across this nation. And some of you even leave this nation and go to unreached people groups. And God can help you to do that. Now, obedience is the key. Obedience is the key. Whatever God says in His Word, obey. And what you're going to ask those people in that discovery study, what you're going to ask them to do is to obey what God says. Now, I urge you, as you're reading through the Bible, maybe some of you try to read through the Bible every year or something along that line, make note... Make note of what God says about obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Obey. In fact, he said in the Great Commission, teach them to obey all that I have commanded. In the Old Testament it says, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than fasting even. The truth is, I know people who fast to lose weight. God doesn't necessarily bless fasting. God blesses obedience. When, you, when God's Word says something, it's very clear to you and you obey it. I promise you, that's where God will bless. When you are obeying what God says. Now, the goal is not just to make disciples, but to make disciple makers. What you're going to try to do is when you're there and you're discipling this group, you're wanting to not only disciple this group, but to make them disciple makers so they go to a next generation. Multiplication is always the goal. I was in Rwanda last year, and we were filming where these disciple-making movements are happening all over Africa. And we were filming what's happening in Rwanda. And we went to this one church. It was actually a person's house. And in their room, they had, had a church that was started there. And my understanding of what we were going to do was we were going to film a discovery Bible study. What I'm talking about now and what we'll describe. But actually what happened was this. There was a man, he was the missionary a Rwandan guy, his name is Justin, and Justin stands up, and Justin said, my name is Justin, I came to this area of Rwanda uh, about three years ago, I was praying, fasting, asking God for, to lead me to a person of peace, there was a man that I met, his name was Augustine, Augustine was open, we started a discovery Bible study with his friends and his family. And Augustine and a number of his family came to faith in Jesus Christ. And then a man stands up and he says, Hello, my name is Augustine. Justin came into our area, started a discovery Bible study with me and my family. 
And one of the questions in the Discovery Bible study is who else needs to hear this story? So I was thinking and praying, who should I tell? And he said, there was a man who was building my house at the time. His name was Pascal. Pascal was open. We started a Discovery Bible study with his friends and his family. And then a man stands up and he goes, hello, my name is Pascal. Augustine started a Discovery Bible study with me and my family. I came to faith in Jesus Christ. Many of my family did. And I thought, who else needs to hear this story? And as I was praying, God laid on my heart a woman. She is the one who scrubs the bricks in the houses that we build. And I, I forget her name, but it's going to be on the next slide. We, we will see it. But he called her name and then she stood up and her head was kind of bowed a little bit and she said I am very shy I don't talk with many people but Pascal came and started a discovery Bible study with me and my family we came to faith in Jesus Christ and so I was praying and fasting who else needs to hear this story and God laid on her heart a man that she had never met. And it was very odd that this woman who is so shy, and you could tell that generally she is a very shy woman, she in obedience, because God called her to do that, went to this man's house, knocked on the door. This man's wife came to the door and she asked for her husband and she says, why do you want to see my husband? And she said, because God has sent me, and I have a message. Well, they were open. And that man and his wife started a discovery study. Go ahead and go to the next slide. They kept talking about this, and I asked them, after eight generations of this, I asked them, can I line all of you up and take a picture. And so from left to right, Justin was the missionary that went to that area of Rwanda. There is Augustine. Pascal is the church planter. Eugenia is the shy woman. She reached out to Olivier. He himself has planted nine churches. He, one of the nine, was Geraldine and her family. Catherine is not there. She is missing, but she is the one who linked to Venamsia and Venamsia to Ignis. You have eight generations of churches that were planted and this didn't cost anything. All of you can do this because the last that I know, prayer is free. Prayer is free. And the truth is, if you will fast, it'll save you a little money. So honestly, this some of you are saying, I don't have any money, I can't do anything for God. That is not true. The Holy Spirit of God is not bound by finances. The Holy Spirit of God can use your prayers and what little you have. Listen, He has found a way to multiply oil in a cruise. He can find a way to use you to see churches planted among people who need to know Him. Go to the next slide. Honestly, this is taking too long. I, I didn't mean to take this long, Pastor David. Let me just run through. This is what a Discovery Bible study would be. You would gather with a group, pretend that there are six or eight Muslims who are gathering together and they're all Muslims and they're in a neighborhood and you found a person of peace and they've gathered with some friends and their family. First question is, what are we thankful for? And let each you start with something that you're thankful for. Make it short, but something you're thankful for and let all of them share. So everyone is going to participate in this. Second question, 
What is a challenge or what is a concern? Everybody has these. You start off. If you will be transparent with your challenge or concern, then that will set the standard for others to share a challenge or concern that they have. Question number three would not happen in the first week. It would happen in the second week and every week after that. But it is, how did it go when you told your story? We'll see that a little later. And how did it go when you obeyed God? We'll see that later too. But this is accountability. At the second week when they come back together, there's accountability for them to tell the story and to how they obeyed God. Then we're going to read the passage. Now, if it's among Muslim people, I would urge you, start with Genesis, not with Jesus. The Bible starts with Genesis. So start with Genesis. We would coach people about 25 different stories through that lead from creation to Christ. And then all along the way, allow the Holy Spirit, you're praying and fasting this entire time. Not every day, but you're praying and fasting regularly. You're praying and fasting that the Holy Spirit of God would use the Word of God and would create the people of God among them. And so these 25 stories, you're just praying and fasting and, and you're waiting for miraculous interventions. You're praying that God would show up in a miraculous way. So you read the passage, whatever it is, if it's a creation passage, and then have someone reread it. Faith comes by what? And hearing by what? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So you're going to read it, or someone else, actually have someone else read it. Someone's going to read it, another person's going to reread it, and then have someone to tell it. In other words, say, all right, can someone share, if you were to tell this story to someone else, how would you say it? And don't worry if you don't get all the details right, that's fine. But... Tell it the best you can. And then let one of them tell the story because, by the way, at the end of this, you're going to want all of them to tell the story to someone else. All right? But someone will tell the story and then fill in the details. Have everybody else fill in the details of the story that they, maybe they've missed. So you're going to read, reread, tell it, and fill in with details. Then here's where praying and fasting is absolutely critical. You're going to ask, or someone's going to ask, what does this story tell us about God? If you have been praying and fasting, and that person is a person of peace, and the Holy Spirit is working in that situation, get ready, because what you're going to hear is some incredible theology coming out of the mouth of those unbelievers. Because the Holy Spirit of God is going to teach them from the Word of God and they will tell you what this text teaches them about God. They will tell you. And you will be amazed at what God is teaching them through the Holy Spirit and His Word. And then you're going to ask them, what does it teach us about us as man, mankind? What does it teach us about us? And then just you're praying, you're fasting. And then the Holy Spirit of God is going to say, this is what it means to you. As a man, as a woman, this is what it means to you. And you're going to sit back and you're going to listen. Go to the next slide. Question number six. If you were to obey God with what you have learned in this story, what would change in your life this week? This is so important, the obedience question. Some of you might ask me, are you seriously asking Muslim people to obey what God said in the Bible? Absolutely. If they're a person of peace, you're not telling them what they're supposed to do. You're asking them, what would you do to obey God from this passage and allow the Holy Spirit to tell them what to do? Now, if they will obey, if they will simply obey what God's Word is teaching them, I believe God will bless them. I believe God blesses obedience, even Muslim people who are finding their way to Jesus, when they will obey what God's Word teaches them, I believe God will bless them. And we can give stories of that that we just don't have time. When people start, villages start coming, strife within the village ceases. 
rain falls on some villages and not on other villages because this village is starting to be blessed and people from other villages come to that village and say, what's going on? Believe me, God will bless obedience. Question number seven. Who else needs to hear this story? Now remember, we had someone tell the story, but you're going to ask all of them, you know, who else do you know that needs to hear this story? Now, if somebody says, well, my friend needs to hear it, then just say, friends are many. Which friend? Tell them, make sure they tell you a person, someone, their neighbor, which neighbor it is, or their sister, or whatever it is. Now, here's what's going to happen. And follow this. If this woman is in this discovery study, and she says, I want to tell my sister. So she goes, and she, either she goes to tell her sister, or she calls her on the mobile, and she tells her the story. Then the next week, you remember that question that says, how did it go when you told your story? All right? Then you're going to let them report back to you, how did it go when you told the story? And she said, well, my sister seemed interested. She asked a couple of questions. So the next week, she says, I'm going to tell my sister again. So she tells her sister again. Eventually, it may come to the point where her sister becomes so interested that she wants to come herself and be a part of that study. All right, this is important. The obvious answer, if her sister wants to come from the neighboring village or another part of town and join this story, the obvious answer to that is no. No, you can't come to this study. Some of you are looking at me like you're shocked. You're, you're not going to let this sister come to the, to the Bible study? You're right. Because if we take that sister out of that village or that section of town, you know what we've done? We might have taken the person of peace out of that village or out of that section of town. We don't want to do that. So we say, no, you can't join this study, but we'll come to your house and we will do this study with you and your family. Those eight generations you saw in Rwanda, that's exactly how it happened. Someone told the story, who told someone else, who told someone else, and now there's eight generations of churches that have been planted. There are a lot of things that we need to be thinking, a mind shift in our thinking. But let me just, a couple of them, then we'll finish Pastor David, I know we need to go. We need to rethink who can be a church planter. God can use ordinary people to become disciple makers. And I have seen some incredible disciple making church planting women across Africa. We need to re rethink the attractional model of church planting is the only way where we are attracting everybody to a facility. I'm not opposed to that, but that's not the only way. Instead of planting churches, we need to facilitate church planting movements. We need to rethink the separation of evangelism and discipleship. There's one thing that we're called to do, and that's disciple the nations. We need to rethink the individual approach to evangelism as the only way or even the most appropriate or productive way. The truth is, many times as you gather with that group, the entire group will come to faith in Jesus Christ. Final slide, I think. Whoops, one more. Sorry. Back. I think I'm doing it. Let's do one more. Go back. Or forward there. We need to consider church planting model that is infinitely reproducible in any and every culture around the world. We need to consider if our current church planting model is sufficient to finish the task. And we need to consider that if something will work in different cultures around the world, it has to be biblical and it has to be simple. Now, I know this is a whole lot of information and it's kind of like drinking from a, a fire hydrant, but let me just say this. I absolutely believe that the potential that resides in this room could change the city of Lagos. 
It is no longer just people who have been professionally trained and somehow they've been ordained and now they're given the title of a church planter. No, the power of Almighty God through the power of the Holy Spirit can use women like you in some incredible ways in every, every section of Lagos and in every community in Nigeria. And that is my prayer for you, and that is my prayer for Dominion City. God bless you. Thank you so much. Give him a big God bless you one more time. Thank you, sir. Now, I'm going to fire three questions because I can see with these questions, I will help you digest digest there's so much you know number one he told me a story about incarnational ministry you know the way jesus left heaven to come to earth his son his own son i went to nashville one of the most beautiful part of the u.s that's where he lives and he keeps coming to africa his own son chose a poor neighborhood. Talk to us about it to go and stay. Uh, we have one son and two girls. Our son is the oldest. His name is Daniel. He married Michelle. Uh, Daniel and Michelle have three children now. Uh, they have chosen to live incarnationally. Now the incarnation is basically where Jesus, he was God, uh, but he made himself of no reputation. And he took upon him the form of a servant, and he was made in the likeness of men. Philippians 2 says that. So incarnational evangelism is where we leave comfort, we leave our safety, we leave our security, and we actually intentionally choose to live in an area that is very difficult. Um, my, my son and his wife chose... Please, sir, you need to say it again. Please, sir. Just one more time. Incarnational ministry. Yes. We leave our safety. Leave our safety and security and choose by choice to live in a very difficult area. Did you hear that? The way Jesus left heaven, you leave your safety, you leave your comfort, you leave your security to go to an area where people are either in poverty, they are suffering, it might even be an area that is dangerous in order to live among them and bring the gospel to them. Yes, go ahead, sir. They, uh, the area that they chose to live in is one of the most crime-ridden areas. It's gangs, it's prostitution, it's drugs. Uh, it's a very challenging neighborhood. Uh, but they chose to buy a home and live in that neighborhood um, and to be, to be Jesus for that neighborhood. Um, we, all of our three grandchildren, their three children were born at home, born with a midwife in that house. Um, and um, the first one, her name is Elise, our oldest grandchild. Um, Elise was born um, in January, cold winter day for us. And she was born in the middle of the night. And so about uh, 2.30 or 3 o'clock, my wife Anita and I went over to the house to see our, our first grandchild. And um, there had been a murder on the house directly across the street that night. Um, there was a murder and they had, the police had taped off an area around the house, including our, our son's yard. Um, for investigation of this murder. And so here we show up at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning at a crime scene, and so they are questioning us, why are you all here? First of all, why are you in this neighborhood? But second of all, why are you here on this crime scene? And we said, well, our son and his wife live here, and our grandchild was just born. And so they let us go in and see our grandchild. I told my son this, her name is Elise. And I, I said, I said, Daniel, I hope that this is a metaphor, a parable of her entire life. I hope that where there is death, she will bring life. I, I hope that's who she is. 
I, I hope that those that walk in darkness will see a great light. And those that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light will shine. And so that's what they have done. The truth is they have an open door policy and everybody in the neighborhood is welcome in their home. Uh, and and uh, they don't own a television. Uh, they don't own a laptop computer. In the U.S. In the U.S. Um, they don't have cell phones. Well, he, he, she is an RN. She's a registered nurse. Our son has a master's degree in city planning and urban design. And his job now has forced him to have a cell phone so that they can communicate with him. But other than that, they did not have a cell phone. And he doesn't even like the idea of having one now. But um, their furniture, they went to used furniture stores and bought very cheap furniture. Everything that they have is very cheap. And so all the people in the neighborhood have come into their home. They've been in their home. They've eaten in their home. And so they know, no one breaks in their house. Because there's nothing to steal. I mean, you, there's no reason to break in their house because there's nothing you can steal and go sell anywhere because they don't have anything. But they've chosen to live that way because that's how they believe that they can impact, intentionally impact that neighborhood. One, one neighbors that they have directly to their right, the very next door neighbor, was a homosexual couple, two men that were living next to them. And they've been in their home many times in fact, I, I know the, uh, the, the, the guys well. And um, they're very welcome in their home. And, and I know sometimes p people look at that and they go, they go ah, that's, that is disgusting. Well, let me, let's go back to Luke chapter 7. You remember what the Pharisee said? This man is not a prophet because if he'd have been a prophet, he would have known what kind of woman this was and he would not allow it. You know that? Honestly, folks. Those of us who are followers of Jesus we need to have compassion on people whose lives are all messed up. Where do we want? Do we want them to go to hell? Honestly. The truth is we need to be reaching out to everybody. We need to be the people who will talk to people that no one else will talk to. That's who we need to be. That's who Jesus is. All right. So incarnationally, that means we will actually befriend people that other people think are grotesque. All right. Okay, I'm going to bring you up one more time, but I want to give an assignment. Okay. Okay. Everybody, bring out your paper. List ten terrible neighborhoods in Lagos or whatever city you come from. 70% of Lagos is slum. So when you pass this kind of place, you assume that this is how Lagos is. I have been to quite a number of them, so I know. In this island, for example, if you go to a quarter, for example, you see where people the kind of environment where people live. Okay, list seven types of neighborhoods. You have a Jegunle. Do you know there are people who live on water? A Butemeta. They use dumps, rubbish, to fill enough to create land. There is no sand. Write ten of those kind of environment. You are going to ask God to lead you to one of them to go and plant a fellowship plant a church. Start a, a, a Bible study group, a discipleship Bible study, and use it to reach the people in that area. Remember what we we're saying. It's almost 60% of the population. I think it's about 50-something percent of the population of Nigeria are women. I, I, we are gathering statistics about some prison, you know, prisons, especially in the northern part, Majority of the prisoners are women. In some cases, 60 something percent. So I don't know what you think about women conferences. I, I really wish, maybe I should have talked with you, and maybe we have used uh, uh, technology to make everybody in all the centers listen. Okay, they are all listening, they are all watching this. Okay. So in case there are 
they are watching in different places the same assignment. You do the analysis of your city, especially those from northern Nigeria, Abuja, Kaduna, and the rest of them, Yola, and the rest of them. Your city. For example, using this city, this one is the melting point of Nigeria. Every part of Nigeria is here. And with the challenge we had in North East, at one time the government said 500,000 people were moving down here on a constant basis. Uh, we have accumulated millions of people. Is Pastor Shola still here? Is he around? He gave me statistics of how many million people are entering this city every year. So any part of Nigeria you want to reach, there are neighborhoods, there are Chinese neighborhoods, there are South African neighborhoods here. They are different. They are, there is East African neighborhood here in Lagos. Everybody lift up your hands. Ask God. I, I also learned that you have had some teachings on you know what but ask God you are learning a lot about prayer you are learning about church planting and all of that oh God where are you going to ask me even if it's your street even if it's not one of these even if it's your own street Lord guide me open my eyes where I need to take this fire when I leave this conference to go and do something with me for you I was praying so much for myself in Canada while we are you know, finishing the talk. I said, Lord, I have only one life. I don't have another. Once this one is over, it's over. Help me to see how to invest it. How to still wash, still, you know, how to invest this life in such a way that it can bring the highest level of yield for you. The highest level of yield for your kingdom. Make me a better steward of my own life, my own time, my own resources. The things you have given me. Show me where I can invest it and it will bring multiplying effects. Help me not to waste my life. In Jesus' name. God is going to show you. He's going to guide you. But you need to make that list. You need to start making that list. You need to make that list. Let me also ask him a second question. Just three and then I want you to go. Um, he told me another story. Because there are, there are professionals from the marketplace here. Um, that, that, you know. This is a mixed multitude, so you, you have different groups here. But you have professionals here. Both business and career professionals. A man invented a technology that is used in the field of metal and all of that. You know, cutting metals and all of that. And he wrote a will. I don't know whether to call it a will, but he gave away. This thing is yielding millions of dollars on daily, weekly, and monthly basis. And he's a believer. And he set up a foundation, invited a team of people to set up a foundation, and he gave away completely all the money that's coming out of that foundation. And then asked the foundation to put him on salary. This is a second type of incarnation. The first one is living comfort, security, and all that to go. This one is about somebody who God has blessed with multiplied millions, who could have spent his life enjoying the best things of life to say no. There are people that are not yet rich. There are unrich people. His, this particular man, his focus is the Muslims. Northern, North Africa, 
Middle East, and he gave away that whole money and chose to be put on salary so that his money can go and affect more people. Please, sir, come and talk to us about it. Um, the man's name, he's a young man. His name is uh, Jason. Um, Jason, actually, when he was uh, 17, uh, he's a brilliant guy. He is absolutely a genius. So when he was 17, he actually created in his mind the technology, but it was until he was 24 that he was able to put everything together. But it's a technology that involves uh, the cutting, uh, precise cutting, precision cutting of steel. And around the world, every steel production facility in the world uses that technology. It is so advanced. And so every steel place around the world, every day when they're using that technology, they're paying royalties to him. Um, he was instantly, in his 20s, a uh, multimillionaire. Um, but he was a very committed believer, very committed follower of Jesus Christ. He had a pastor who had in, instilled in him a passion for people, and especially Muslim people. And so when he was about 30 years old, and he's not, he's maybe, I don't think he's 40 years old yet, but when he was about 30, he took the entire company that he had created and he put that in a trust. Legally, he signed away his company to put it in a foundation. So it's irrevocable, he cannot get it back. So all, all of the funds that come to that foundation are, he receives a monthly salary, and that's all from that foundation. But the rest of it, which is millions of dollars, um, goes to reach Muslim people groups around the world. And the truth is, as I, as I met Jason for the first time, I, I just thought in my mind, just as sure as I'm standing here, just as sure as I'm standing here today, one day I will stand up there. And the Bible tells me I'll have a white robe on and I'll have a palm branch in my hand and I'm going to be singing a new song. And as I sing that new song, I'm going to look around and I'm going to see people. Revelation 5, 9 says, from every tribe, every nation, every language, every people. I'm going to look around and I'm going to see all of you. And I'm going to say, praise God. And then I'm going to look around. I'm going to see hundreds of thousands or millions of Muslim men and women and boys and girls. And they are going to come from all different Muslim people groups across Africa and the Middle East and Central Asia and the Indian subcontinent. And I'm going to look at Jason, and I'm going to say, thank you, Jason, for being obedient to God. Because Jason will tell you that it's really not a sacrifice because this world is not his home. He's just a passing through. His treasure is laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I cannot feel at home in this world anymore. Because time is winding up, I'm not talking about your conference, I mean the last days is gradually, we, we don't know when it, it will be all over. But at this moment, I just want us to do a second assignment, Take open up your notes. Because when this conference is over, these are the things you're going to go back to. I'm sure you must have received an assignment about prayer. Don't just make prayer a meeting, prayer meeting. Have a regular day of fasting every week. If it's Wednesday that works for you, or Tuesdays, every week. I think I was with you one time. I don't know what it was, a Wednesday or a Thursday, you told me, 
today is, is our Wednesday. For him, it's a Wednesday. You have to have a day at least every week. It's not until you attend a prayer meeting. It's not a program. We're now talking about the lifestyle we need in these last days to be able to drive God's purpose on earth. And of course, uh, the pastor of the church uh, and Pastor Phoebe and the same thing. These things must now become part of the culture. What we are talking about is to change the way churches are being done to use this discipleship making movement model as a DNA. If you, if you, if you listen, so much was packed. I saw how the tape we are going to make available for you will not be this tape. It will be the other one. He was running with so much speed. At one time I felt like slowing you down and telling you to come again, but you know, it's all right. Uh, there is a tape we did this morning. That's the one. That, yes, let them get that one so that all of them can have it, you know, before you go. But here's the point. So, prayer is not just events anymore. It's a culture. A culture a culture. There is nothing we are going to be able to do without it. Create a weekly day. A day a week when you fast. Now from there you can grow. There might be times you might be led to do you know, longer seasons of fasting. There is nothing wrong with that. We too, we do that every January. We did one June this year. We have done twice now this year. But that's the event. But the culture is that you have a consistent life of prayer and fasting. Num number two, we've talked about this issue. Find an aspect of the city, even if it's your street, your company, where you work, where you're going to take a church planting movement and start the process of multiplication. I made a pack with Pastor Sarah that um, we are going to run. I will see, we agree that it's between now and somewhere next year a full training program for you guys on church planting movement, on discipleship making movement. You know, like the men have done, you sit down for three days and take, take this training and then other processes will start beyond that. Because I know that some of the things you are hearing, some of us is still flying, you know. There are some of us who are, um, who understand it better, but there are others Probably when we start, we start mainly with your leaders and all the top leaders. You bring them from everywhere. At the end of the day, you can start multiplying, going down from there. Okay, now we're talking about finances. It's not just about giving as an event. I came for a program, I gave, I went to church, I gave. No, no, no. Write it down as a structure your finance in a way that what portion? This man, and there are many. I went there to, you know, to meet with him and meet with another organization that is um, how do I describe this for you? Pastor Sir, I try to describe it for you. Just their ministry is books. Pumping resources. All types of materials. I went to talk with their board. Five man board. About helping us with certain strategic materials for the work that is happening within the continent of Africa, especially Nigeria. Now, now, I'm looking for a multinational organization here in Nigeria I can use because I know, I know, I know Chevron and I know Mobile, their building is a child's play. If you see the sky, skyscraper where he took me to, I said, where, what, what is this? Is this an oil company, a bank? He said, no. Is this a church? It's not even a church. It's just a ministry dedicated to push Christian literatures around the world. How long have they been there? How long has that organization been? Um, over 100 years. I, I, honestly, 125 years, I think. If you see the kind of place I'm talking about, there are streets, even the major streets. If you see the number of buildings and facilities... I, I, I can't, I'm looking for, in South Africa you will have, maybe you are something convention center. Then you now start talking about many, many buildings because it's a very large, it's a small city. Maybe your son's city. 
So I'm trying to describe it for them here. I'm, I'm not finding, because we don't really have much. I'm looking for even government institutions. Maybe if you go to CBN Abuja, the, the, the building here is taller than CBN. And then you have many, many of that to form a kind of city dedicated only to what? And I went to sit with the five men running this thing and met, sat with the main guy that is sitting on it and was telling his story. Now, we are, we are still like children here. I have realized the things we make mouth about in Nigeria, you know, until the purpose of God has really shifted us into shape. So, and he was telling me, there are many individuals like that, Jason. Many. They make money, multiply millions of dollars, and choose not to live in affluence. And I asked them, for what? They find an aspect of the mission of God and take it. And use most of that money to finance it. Even if you are not yet an executive, you are just a beginner, you're just working, it's not when you become big that you need to make that decision, it's now. If this trip that he made can catalyze a lifestyle, a culture of prayer and fasting, a culture of CPM or discipleship making movement, that culture of multiplication and catalyze also a culture of stewardship, adjustments in our lives so that we can do this. Because I showed Pastor Sarah, I think a day or two before your conference started, I was showing her how many internally displaced children we have in Nigeria, the different places they are. And I showed her pictures. Some of them, they sleep in the floor. The floor is their classroom, their home, their church, their hospitals. And there are children like us. And many of them, they, they don't know where their parents, their father and mother, because they've been killed by Boko Haram. And I was telling her, what specific, apart from the fact that you were building schools, I said, thank God for schools, and I encourage that. I'm not stopping. But I want expansion of your social project to include this group. I'm not asking you for fundraising. I'm not raising funds for you. You guys can raise your own fund. I'm not interested. In, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a lifestyle. Something that is built into how you live your life. Not somebody coming to raise funds. Whether it is a percentage of all my income. Whether it's this. That's why a young girl was telling me the father, you know, could afford to send them to the best Universities, the private schools in our com when she caught this thing, she chose to attend a very good school, but that was cheaper. These are all forms of incarnation. Very good school that was cheaper, so it wasn't in the urban centers in the cities. So that the, what the father would have paid on her head, she asked the dad to give her fifty percent of the income. So she could use it to pay the school fees of 40 other children wow. in northern Nigeria. Yes. Wow. Half, 50% of her own school fees paid for 40 in the north. And that's what has been going on. Now she started a, her own foundation. And God is giving her some bright ideas that will create a lot of money. She's still a young girl. She has already started making a few millions. I actually believe it's because of this kind of people, this kind of heart, this giving and sending her that God blessed America. That's what makes, that's what to me, what the American spirit is all about. And that's what I believe that is going to make Nigeria stand out. When we can get the church in Nigeria to experience a conversion this way, not just salvation. When the things we do, including conferences like this, no more just about us. Women coming together just to 
talk about themselves, how to better their own life. And you are the ones already enjoying the best of life. You live in Lagos. And the other ones that are watching, whether it's from Abuja and other, you are among those enjoying the best of life until you go to find out what is happening in this same country. In this same Lagos, 70% of it are slums. Where you dump your dustbin, you throw away. There are people who live on it and it's their bed. They, 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 they do their business in the water, bath in the same water, drink that same water. So I, um, I do not believe that we don't have money to finance mission. It's just that those, God's own people, need to adjust their life and adjust their priorities. So write it down. What is it that you're going to do? First of all, lift up your hands and ask the Holy Spirit. Show me what exactly you want me to do about finance and mission. Finance and mission. Show me exactly what you want me to do. Show me what adjustments I need to make. There are some of us that might not give away everything, but they will be able to give away certain percentages. There are some that God will give the same grace as Jesse. This kind of spirit and this kind of thinking is going to open the doors for God to really pour his blessing. In Jesus' name. One I'm lasting, I want to, you know, I'm going to, I wanted to ask you one more question, but I'm going to leave it there because it's already one. But one more thing you need to do, open up that paper, is accountability. Create accountability for yourself. Did you see, hear what the man said? He gave away that to a foundation so that he can make it irreversible. Because if he didn't do that and left it only to himself, there are situations that sometimes change in life. Maybe you find yourself maybe in need of some more money or situations, whatever. You might be tempted to go back on commitments you made from God. So you're going to have to find two or three people that will be your accountability partner. You show them the commitments you've made. I'm going to be planting, you know, a church or a cell or whatever here. And you're going to watch me. To make sure that I do it. This is the kind of money I said I'm going to be giving out to God. Even your leaders, you can also use them as your accountability partner. I have people I do it for. I also have people that do it for me. I told Pastor Sarah, I said I have three layers of accountability. That your minister is not enough. Anybody that does not have accountability, we will not, the chances of not living in obedience is slim. If you make a commitment to obey God, create accountability around yourself, the chances are high that you will do it. So that's the next thing you need to do. It might be your fellow sisters who live around you. It might be one or two of your who are also believers. I want you to hold me accountable concerning these things so that year in, year out, there will be results. It won't be like what a New Year resolution, something you just say, you walk away and forget it. Write down such people, write it down. I'm creating an accountability system for myself. 
I'm going to approach Pastor Sarah or I'm going to approach this person. I'm going to approach Sister Dees. I'm going to approach this person, you know, to be my, you know. I'm sorry for mentioning your name because you will get more problem that you can handle. It's done among brethren. It's done among brethren. And there's nothing wrong if you also, you can see that that gentleman asked his pastor and he created a board. His pastor was in that board and he brought in a few other people, brought in somebody that is into mission in that board. And now it turned into, it went from beyond a desire, a wish to something that is now affecting the world. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Sarah, that we're able to interfere with you. I think we'll see you one more time before you will go, if we're able. I don't want to overstress him, but I will see if we're able to do that. You know, God bless you. God bless you, man. You know.